So I'm just going to introduce the next speaker that we have coming up here. This is Carrie Peters. She is a professional people watcher and stalker, she tells me. So she's coming up here. She's going to give us a talk about UX, Y, and Z, which shows how user testing and people profiling can shape a business. So we're just going to quickly get her, her laptop up here, and then she's going to blow us all away with her excellent talk. Hi, everyone. Good. I think we're still making it under good morning. Um, if you guys don't hear me, just stick your hand up. I sometimes take the microphone away. Um, and first of all, most important thing, I just want to say, guys, thanks so much for organizing such a great event. You guys rock. And to you guys, thanks for coming this morning and, and for the next two days. You guys are awesome as well. First thing I want to do is ask you a question. Out of all of you, who checked your phones in the last five minutes? So WhatsApp, email, Facebook, a lot of you. And who checked your screens and your phones in the last one hour? Also, most of you, OK. All right, so we all have our weaknesses. 45 minutes is quite a long, way, long time to talk. So I'm also going to look at my screen and uh, make sure that my slides are still here. And um, I also am wearing high heels, so I get to hold onto the podium, make sure I don't fall off. OK, so my talk is mainly about why and why it's so important to ask the question why, how we use it to influence business and behavior. All right, so about eight years ago, I stumbled upon this discovery. And for me, it was a light bulb moment. And uh, it profoundly changed the way that I see the world and the way the world works and the way we work within the world. Now, most of the successful businesses in this world, they already know this insight. Um, and they spend millions of dollars researching this insight. And what they know is that we are all psychologically and biologically hardwired to behave in a certain way. This is something that the less successful businesses don't really spend time worrying about. All right, so this is how I discovered it for myself. Okay, moving on to the next slide. All right, so when I was 29 years old, I saw the world with a completely um, new, kind of, I had a new lease on life. I just moved back to South Africa from London, started a brand new job in retail, and I was deeply excited. I'd wanted to get into retail for ages. And I was brand newly single, and I was driving down to Minas for a wild weekend away with my grand, who was 90 at the time. <laughs> but uh, we were on our way, and we, we just stopped for lunch, and we were looking out of uh, the beautiful harbor that was in front of us um, on the way down to Minas, And it was one of those moments where you think that I'm feeling truly alive right now. This is absolutely stunning. And at that moment, my doctor, who I just recently visited, phoned me. And I thought, wow, this is the world's friendliest doctor. Um, not quite sure what she's on about, but she was asking me questions like, where are you right now? Um, can you come in and see me? And I said to her, I can't do that. I'm off on my wild weekend. So she wanted to know, who are you with? Where are you going? What are you doing right now? And I thought, this is a little bit awkward. And I wasn't quite sure how to respond to her. Is she stalking me? And then she said, Kari, I'm sorry to tell you this over the phone, but you've got breast cancer. And I'm not quite sure what my facial expression looked like at the time, but I'm sure it was something like this. So let me tell you what happens with our brains. It's kind of like a dual core system, so it works in parallel. So we have our automatic side and we have the manual side. The one side is the more emotional side. The other side is the more cognitive side. And what's happening here is we, we feel first, and then we think second. And it takes us about a fifth of the time to process an emotional bit of information than it does our cognitive information. So what was happening here is in the first split second, I was feeling something. I was feeling a sense of sympathy. And it still took my brain about another five seconds or, to, or so to really kind of catch up to what that feeling had already told me. So what was I thinking about? I was thinking, oh gosh, um, this poor doctor, shame. First of all, the lab's gone and mixed up the results. So she's going to feel awful about this. She's going to have to come back and apologize to me, and it's fine, because I don't mind. And then she's still going to go and have to break the news to the poor person out there who's still walking around with the cancer and doesn't know about it. 
that poor person. Okay, some, some might actually call that denial. Okay, and then the next emotion was a complete sense of surprise. And suddenly it started sinking in. And again, in a split second, I felt something that took my brain about another five seconds to catch up on. And this surprise kind of caught me unawares and I realized, oh, okay, so you had an intuitive feeling for the last six months and that's why you went to the doctor three times to check it out. You know what? You were right. So <laughs> it is you, it's not another person. The doctor didn't make a mistake, so what now? Then the next set of feelings was a complete sense of calm and I'm not sure where that came from. Some kind of level of acceptance and then there was a small amount of relief. And I remember um, thinking that, you know, it, it's actually, it's, it's not too bad. And I said to the doctor, Karen, don't worry, it's not a train smash. Which is honestly what I thought at the time because if I was going to die, I wouldn't have to save up money for a pension anymore. <laughs> Okay, so as a part-time coach, I understand that 75% of job successes are really, it will come down to these three things. The one is that when you're de dealing with a stressful situation, you can look at it as a challenge, not as a threat. So how was I able to see this as some kind of challenge and not necessarily as a threat? And the other two things are you have to have a pretty solid sense of optimism and a good support structure or social connections around you to help out. All right, I've always been in interested in human behavior, so why do people do what they do? And is there a way that we can influence it? Right at the end of my treatment, I was chatting to my oncologist and she asked me, Kari, so what did you get out of this whole experience? I think we've jumped a bit. Sorry, just taking it back. So she was saying, Kari, what, what did you get out of this whole experience? And I, she was used to hearing things like, well, hair loss, memory loss, hot flushes. And I said to her, there was one big lesson that I learned through the whole process. And that is that if we don't have strong connections with really good people who are close to us and are willing to look after us, we are a shit creek without a paddle. So that's the first time I realized in my life that social connections are our most valuable currency that we have, not just as individuals, but as businesses as well. This is Dr. Donald Winnicott. He's a British, uh, was a, a British pediatrician and psychoanalyst. And the great thing about him is he, he apparently was the first man to ever discover that as babies, and this is between about four to 10 weeks old, this is the first time that we have some kind of social action where our mom smiles at us and we, we respond with a smile of our own. It also happens to be an emotional action. Now, personally, I'm not so sure about this because I'm sure that since the dawn of time, mothers from all over the world have had their own idea about what our first emotional action is. But actually, what he was trying to prove there was that we are come prepackaged with a survival mechanism. Unfortunately, not with instruction manuals, but we have the survival mechanism in us, and it's purely to help us build social interactions, social connections. It's crucial for our survival as well as for business. It's a biological foundation of human reciprocity. So these social connections drive action. So let's what hap uh, have a look at what happens when there's this transaction of emotional energy. First of all, the mother feels a kind of feeling that's a motivator or an activator. It's this spark of emotion. In her case, it's a sense of joy and pride in what she's created. The next thing is her action. So she smiles at her baby. The baby recognizes this action from his or her mom as something warm and fuzzy. And that amplifies the baby's feelings itself. And the baby responds back with a transaction, with a smile of its own. Okay, so we know that social connections and emotional connections are important for driving action, but it's not always from one person to another. Sometimes it happens from one person to many and when things go viral. So this is Jonah Berger and he wrote a book called Contagious, Why Things Catch On. Now he took 7,000 different articles from the New York Times and he wanted to find out what makes these articles spread. Is there a common denominator? 
do you know what he found out? The, the ones that were being spread the most were the ones that had some kind of positive or happy emotion included within the content. And this is backed up by the IPA data bank study, and this is not to be confused with um, Indian Pale Ale, my, my favorite. It's the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising. And what they looked at was 100, uh, 1,400 case studies, and they realized that all of the most successful ad campaigns were the ones that had more emotional content instead of rational content. They were twice as effective. So I'm getting to the point of being twice as effective. This probably looks similar to what most of you are experiencing at the moment with a lot of load shedding going on. This is what my house looked like yesterday. And uh, so Generac is a generator company in America. And what they did was they realized they weren't growing. In fact, their competitors were taking over. And they decided for the first time, instead of just focusing on their technical specifications, was to actually spend some time with their customers. So they asked their customers to draw the experience that they had with their generators. Now the guys went out and drew these superheroes coming in and saving the day. And the women drew the absolute fear that they felt when the electricity went out and they didn't have a generator. So the idea there that they realized was that fear was the emotional driver here. And they started incorporating that kind of content in with um, testimonials from all of their real users so it wasn't just tech specs anymore, it was tech specs and testimonials based on emotion in their marketing messages, in their websites. Two years later, they managed to double their sales. So is emotional content important in websites? Of course, definitely it is. Okay, so I had a, another watershed moment in my life about a few years ago, I was working at Kalahari as a UX researcher and content strategist. And at that time, I wasn't looking for another job, but Associated Media Publishing offered me a job to come and head up their digital department. And I thought, what do I do? I, I don't actually want to move, but 10 years ago, this was my dream job. So I thought, you know, anyone who knows the, the media industry in South Africa, Jane Rafedi, brands like O Mag Magazine and Cosmopolitan, good housekeeping, Marie Claire, how can you say no to that? So I joined, and it took a few months to realize, oh, I don't think I made the right move. Suddenly I wasn't spending so much time with users and customers anymore. We we're spending a lot of time on other things and I realized I wasn't necessarily that happy in what I was doing. Fortunately at that stage I was busy studying my master's level of coaching and I got to use associated media as a platform to do a lot of my own research. And one of the things I wanted to know was what do most women want? And there were lots of different options. So did women want to start their own business? Was it important to, to begin a new career? Did they want better relationships? Did they want more money? Did they want time freedom or financial freedom? Was balance important or did they want happiness? Okay, can anyone guess what it was? And I'll give you a little hint here. It wasn't that. Most women wanted happiness as the most important thing. And that was a, a little bit of a problem for me because this 90-year-old grand of mine had spent her life telling me that happiness lies within. It took me about 35 years to realize that, but it, it got there. But the problem was is that most of these women were still thinking that they could try and strive for happiness on the outside, in the external world. That's also a problem because positive psychologists know that even if they know absolutely every detail about your external world, they can only t predict 10% of your long-term happiness. 90% of your happiness really comes down to the way you perceive your own world, how your brain perceives your world. So this is Simon Sneck and he wrote um, Start With Why. And he says, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This is his famous golden circle, and he explains around this golden circle that we all have a neocortex as part of our brain. This is the part that's the what part. We ask the question what, we analyze data. It's the part where language um, takes place. And then we have the limbic brain, which is all about your feelings. This is where we build trust. This is where we make decisions. 
This is what drives our behavior, and there's no language involved at this level. So if we communicate from the outside in, we can get customers to understand what our features and benefits are, but we can't really drive their behavior. But if you can communicate from the inside out, then you're driving human behavior, and then you get the customer to a point where they can rationalize their decision. So we know that feelings or motivators are important and they drive action. But how can we communicate persuasively to the inside part that drives behavior? How can we influence feelings or perceived experience? And how can we improve life? So can we hack feelings and can we have, hack a happy emotion? Yep, you bet we can. So there's one cool little thing called oxytocin. It's a neuropeptide found in mammals. And this is responsible for building trust, social connections, and it's released with mothers who are giving, um, giving birth to a child or breastfeeding. So it's the kind of things that really force you to survive and, and make sure that you keep your child alive. This is what influences your behavior, the choices that you make, the thoughts that you have. So how can we hack this and get it to be released in our bodies? Paul Zak is a neuroeconomist and he calls this the, the moral hormone or the love hormone. And he did a study and what he found was that social networking creates the same kind of release. So our brain still interprets that as an in-person kind of interaction or relationship. So social networking is one way of doing it. And the other way is if you can go and give someone a hug eight times a day and that will release it for you. This is an element that scammers use really, really well. Um, in fact, he, he, he was privy to this by personal experience, where he said that if you build trust in someone, that's one thing. If you show someone that you trust them, that'll give you the same kind of release or even better kind of release. So when he was younger, he was a student, he was working in a, a gas station, and he didn't really know much at that stage. But this guy came out of the bathroom and said, he's just found this golden necklace in the bathroom. He doesn't know what to do. It looks like it's quite expensive, so they've got to go and find the owner. Someone must be missing it. And just at that moment, the phone ran. So Paul answered the phone, and, and the guy on the, other, on the other side of the line said, he's in so much trouble right now. It's his anniversary. His wife's going to kill him. He got this golden necklace, but now he's gone and lost it somewhere. He doesn't know what to do, but he is going to offer a $200 reward for anyone who finds it. So he said, oh, golden necklace. We've got one here. In fact, the guy's just bought it from the bathroom. Don't worry, it's safe. And the guy said, oh, fantastic. Please, please tell the man, stay at the gas station. I'm on my way. I'll be there in half an hour. And I'd be more than happy to give him a $200 reward. So he puts the phone down and he says to the guy, problem solved, the guy's on his way. And, and guess what, you're gonna get a $200 reward for this. And the guy said, oh, you know, he wishes he could stay, but he's really got this important job interview and he needs this job, he has to go. And uh, he needs to go now, so he said, but it's fine, you know, you've been so helpful, you've been really kind, so what I'll do is I'll give you the golden necklace, you can give me $100 and when he arrives, he'll give the $200 to you and you can keep the whole thing. So you see it, right? You got, you got nailed there. Dopamine is another thing that we can hack. So it's the kind of thing we feel with emotion. It's, it's the sense we get when we achieve something, when we feel recognized, or also when there are little, bits of ch um, little chunks of information, when we feel enticed to read a bit more and read a bit more. It's kind of like a soap opera effect. Well, one way that we can hack it is with music. So when we listen to music that makes us feel good, like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, that releases um, the, the stuff in your body. But the cool thing about that is, is a lot of people expect that it's, it's the chords, um, the major chords that cause the happiness, and the minor chords actually cause sadness. It's not that at all. It's actually the tension and the release and the way your own brain interprets the music that makes a difference. So, ah, oh, the audio is working. So this should be releasing a bit in your body right now. In fact, it's not the only time it does it. Even the anticipation 
of listening to that kind of music can release it for you. Or the anticipation of more chunks of information will release it for you. Then there's serotonin, and this is when you feel valued or you feel significant. Now one way you can hack it is you can go and spend some time in sunshine or you can use imagination. I'm sure all of you have been through the experience where you've, you've had a complaint to make. The site's not working at all, something's broken, they've taken your money, but you're not sure if this whole thing has gone through and you are riled up. Angry as can be. You've been saving up your whole month of frustration. Everything that's gone wrong you're going to take out on this customer support person. And then you get someone who's born for this job. And they've been looking forward to your call all week long. So you're just about to get started and you're on a roll and you, as you take off, they say to you, don't worry. They make you feel like you are the most important person on earth. That your issue, there, there is no other issue. That this is the most terrible mistake that could have happened. And they will get right down to the bottom of it and they start looking at all the different scenarios and they tell you what they're doing and they tell you how important this is to them that they get this right for you. Eventually, they've gone through such a process with you that by the time you put down the phone, your issues are completely resolved, dissolved, gone away, you're feeling like a much nicer person and you put down the phone and you think, how did that happen? So. That's a customer support person who knows how to really serotonin in your body. Make sure that they can dissolve you down to a situation where you're not going to be so angry about it. So that's one way of doing it. The whole thing with imagination as well is, is that's why things like dream boards are so popular. If you can imagine yourself in a situation where you feel significant and create that reality in your brain, that is how your brain will interpret it. Because the brain has trouble telling the difference between what's real and what's imagined. Now Maslow did a study of what, what makes people lead a happy life. What makes them have better relationships in their life and good social connections? Why do they feel like they're doing work that matters to them? Why do they feel like they have purpose? So he looked at a number of different determinants, things like what was their family structure like? Was it good and positive, healthy, or was it a bad situation? What were their finances like? Were they in a very good financial position? They didn't have to worry about anything or were they struggling a little bit? Was their health good or bad? Had they ever experienced any major losses? And what he found out from that study was these people were people who lived in the peak potential of possibility. I almost feel like you need to say it with a little bit of a Deepak Chopra kind of tone with the peak potential of possibility. But but he does speak about that quite a lot, but it's using all five of our senses, but not only the five senses. It's all make, also making sure that you don't let go of your dreams. These were people who believed that they could do whatever they wanted, be whatever they wanted, and create whatever they wanted. So in a way, they would manifest their own reality. Another study was done, and it's called the Genius Life Study. Now, first of all, what makes up a genius? So this is a person who can take in information and shape that information through a number of different modalities. So five of them are the five senses. The other one is intuition. The next one is imagination. Now, this is something I didn't know, but apparently most of us are born at that level of genius. By the time we reach the age of five, only 20% of us are operating at that level. And by the time we reach the age of 20, we go down to about 2%. So what is causing that disconnect from when we were geniuses to what we are now today? It's the way our brain processes the world. It's how we perceive ourselves. It's the reality that we create for ourselves, our own internal judgment. We're too old to do something. We don't have the right connections. We don't have the right skills. It's that internal doubt. And then we get to endorphins, and I'm sure all of us know how to hack that one. A little bit of exercise. But exercise is not the only way. It turns out smiling and laughing also causes the same kind of release. But even the anticipation of a good joke or the chuckle that you're going to have can still release that. So now we know. We know that it's important to build connections, strong social connections with people as individuals and businesses. And we know that 
bringing in some kind of emotion or, or feeling is important as well. So why then are so many businesses putting data over people? Why are we, why are we treating people as if they're just data reading, conversions, dollar signs, people who've registered, people who've actually checked out? So instead of treating our customers who we've built the product for in the first place, we're treating them like a piece of data. And then we think that if we measure all of that data, that's going to tell us everything we need to know about what improvements we need to make. We make assumptions and sometimes based on incomplete information. And then we make decisions based on what we think we know. So not everything is measurable. Things like feelings and emotions, frustrations, these things aren't necessarily measurable in the same way. We don't know if these people were treated well. We don't know if they were happy with the experience and we also don't know why they dropped off. So I'd like to ask you, when last did you spend time with your customers? When last did you watch someone neutral, not your mother, not your teammate, not your boss? When did you watch someone neutral use your product? So what I would really like to see in UX businesses or, or companies is that we break that limited design cycle. That instead of being so reliant on the metric revolution, we actually go a little bit further than that and move beyond that to a behavioral revolution. I'd like more of our businesses to ask why on top of what, and I'm not saying that you should stop asking what, I'm just saying that there is an extra question after that. Every path should originate from the people who make your company possible. Okay, so this is Kalahari.com back in the good old days when it still existed. Now, we discovered a, a little bit um, of information that data couldn't tell us at that stage. So the first thing we did is, um, well, first of all, Kalahari was uh, not user-centric at all by the time I joined them. They they made sure that all decisions were led by category managers. Everything that you saw there was driven by category managers and marketers. That was pretty much it. And then we started off a UX department. And we really got stuck into trying to do things properly. So we came up with a UX strategy. We made sure we aligned that to the company objectives and the brand attributes. And we shared this with all of our employees. So we did training, we, we created documentation. And then we went into customer understanding mode. So we looked at all the feedback we could collect from customer support from all over the business. We did site audits. We made sure we did competitor benchmarking. We did persona, uh, persona profiles, created some of those. User journey maps, user testing, the whole caboodle that you guys are used to seeing. And then we would go into the UX design process. And we would use each one of those insights and we'd get our clients involved, our clients, our customers, and they would all take part in these participa participatory design workshops. And then we would do iterative prototyping. So nothing went into that design without users being involved. And we were extremely proud about it at that stage because it was brand new in the business, hadn't been done before. So it was really starting something off from scratch. Now I'll tell you one of the problems that uh, we, we came up with, that data was telling us, but they couldn't really tell us why. And the problem was something like uh, cameras weren't selling. So data was telling us that camera, cameras weren't selling. Now, if we had have looked at the problem from purely the business kind of uh, side, we could have made based the assumptions on, well, maybe we didn't have a big enough range. Um, maybe the category managers should go and do something about that. Maybe the price was too expensive, or maybe it was just that our customers didn't perceive the difference in price, that we were actually a lot less expensive than our competitors were. So now if we had have jumped at a solution right at that point in time, we would have made a mistake. We would have said to the category managers, you know what, if you don't have a wide enough range, go and broaden your range. We would have said to them, drop your price. Maybe that will sort out the problem. And we would have said to the marketing department, spend more money on promoting our cameras. That will solve the problem. So what, 
we could have done there is we could have changed the behavior and gotten or motivated people to buy more cameras. Now this is BJ Fogg and this is an example from him of why we would have possibly been making a bit of a mistake there. Now he is the Stan, he or he started up the Stanford Persuasive Lab. A very smart man, he created his own diagram here. And what he was trying to say was that if we have high motivation but a low ability to do something, so let's say for example sites really damn difficult to use, then what we'll need to do is we'll have to facilitate or, or add a little bit of extra help. So we might need some help with text, maybe a video, maybe extra imagery, but that person will need help to complete their task. Now if we have low motivation but high ability, so a site is really easy to use, then what you need to do is spark something there, motivate that person to complete that action. That'll be something that's emotion-based, maybe fear or hope. But if you have high motivation and high ability, then you're golden. Then all you need to do is drop a little signal, drop an email, say, here we are, come by us, and there, you're sorted. So now, what he was saying here is that there's, there's a little bit of a problem. We, what do we focus on first? As a business, do we focus more on motivation or do we focus more on the ability? And what he found here was that motivation is quite expensive. You're going to spend a lot of money trying to motivate someone to do something. It takes quite a bit of time to get there as well. A lot of effort, if you're creating a lot of instructional information to help someone along, it might take a while. So your biggest return on investment is really focusing on the ability of someone. So making sure that you're making the product easier to use first and then spend some time on motivation afterwards. So what we found here, why cameras weren't selling, <laughs> is that, okay, so this is a, a bit more of a close-up of what the screen looked like. And what you have here is the categories on the left-hand side, a lot of waffle up at the top, a lot of confusing categories that customers weren't really sure about. What did they mean? Why, were, why, were, why was there a books category and an e-books category? Surely they should be lumped together. There was a lot of stuff, but if you were looking for a camera, the first thing you would get to is electronics and you would think, okay, maybe it's under there. And then you would go through the electronics section and you would realize, well, okay, it's not there. Then you would go down a bit further and you'd see the word photographic, but if you weren't looking for photographic, you might not twig straight away if you're looking for the word cameras. Especially difficult when you're dealing with companies like Amazon. And if you're shopping there and you see used to seeing cameras under electronics, that's already a bit of behavior that you've, or a bit of learned behavior that you used to doing. Or if you shop on Best Buy, you're used to looking for cameras, not photographic. So what we found here is that our customers just actually weren't finding the category. They had the waffle in the beginning. They had to think about that. It was way too much effort. They would look in electronics and they couldn't find it there. And they weren't really bothering to get onto the photographic level. So it's a very simplified um, example, but the issue there is that big impact can come from small shifts. So just by asking a different question, spending time with our users and, and putting them through user testing, did we realize that all of the assumptions that the business had made previously were actually wrong? Now Einstein said the important thing is to never stop questioning. So recently I did a, a, another round of user testing for a different client, I can't tell you who they are. But the whole process there was they wanted to do an on online application. So get rid of paper, make the process a lot more easy. And what the first round of sessions had uncovered was that, of course, users love this new online application. They would love an on online application process. But if we stopped asking questions at that point, we wouldn't have realized that, of course they did, it was easier than paper. But the problem is, is that with more user testing and chatting to these users and spending more time with them, we realized it wasn't as simple as that. They still expected someone from the company to sit with them and help them through the application process because it was still too complicated. So yes, they loved the online application form, but they still needed some help. If the company had have stopped there, they would have made a grave mistake. So now we know if we spend more time connecting with our customers, spending time with them, understanding their human behavior, it leads to better diagnosis and it leads to better design solutions. 
Persona profiles, making sure that you understand the differences between your, your personas. If you understand human behavior, yes, you have a distinct advantage, but if you can identify the differences between them, you have an even better advantage. So all of us have heard many excuses of why we can't do user testing, why we haven't got the ability to spend time with our customers. So my number one excuse is there isn't enough time. And yes, if you want to launch a product quickly, it is going to slow you down. But if you want to launch a great product, it'll speed you up in the long run. So my, my take out there is instead of launching something quickly and hoping that you're going to learn everything about your customer that you need to know then, rather learn early now instead of launch early. This is my favorite excuse in the book. We'll test it when it's finished. Mm, no. <laughs> so that's putting the cart before the horse. I'd say to that, rather do feedback iteratively, constant feedback as you're going through the process, instead of do and redo. It kind of sounds like do, re, mi. You don't want to be in that, that kind of cycle. Excuse number three, we don't have budget for that. So this is something I always, it hits me between the eyes and I think, well, it's going to cost you money now, it's going to cost, cost you money later maybe a lot of time extra because you, you'll have to go back and fix the process. So why not just spend the money now? And if you build a house, what do you do? You get a, an architect to put the plans together. You get the builder. You get certificates of compliance. There's a lot that you do in the process and there's a lot that you budget for. So surely we should be planning out this design process a lot more efficiently to take that into account and build that cost in right now. And the last excuse, people don't really know what they want. Absolutely not. It's not their job to know. It's, it's your job to know. What users can tell you is what their goals are and what their frustrations are, and then it's your job to go and figure out what they need. Okay, so if you don't remember anything out of this entire talk, I want you to please go away with these seven insights. Connect with your customers. They're the ones who pay your salary. Stop being so obsessed with just what. Start asking why. Understand the hidden motivators, the hidden feelings within your customers, and then design persuasive experiences around that. Inspire that kind of action. Trust your customers. It's just as important as getting them to trust you. Think of your customers as your significant other, not just a metric and appeal to the five senses and the imagination in all of your communication if possible. And how you make others feel says a lot about you, so make it good. So thanks very much guys, you've been very, very patient. And if anyone's got questions, please shoot. Um, regarding the users not being able to find the cameras on Kalahari, um, what was the difference? Is it uh, engaging with the menu as opposed to the search function? Uh, okay, so one thing I forgot to mention in the talk was back in those days, our search functionality wasn't working that well. So you could search for it, but the kind of um, result that you would get would be from a book about cameras to a dog's bed kind of thing. So unfortunately back in those days it wasn't really working the way we wanted. But yes, I mean people were searching, they just weren't finding what they wanted, which was another frustrating process. But would they use the menu more or the search function? Um, well, we found that initially customers were going for the search function, but because they were getting used to not finding what they wanted, the fallback was, was the menu, which is different to other e-commerce clients that I've been working with recently, where obviously search is the biggest thing, but you learn that behavior. Anyone else? Yeah, I'm getting off lightly today. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh, one more. You mentioned testing and connecting with your users as, as soon as possible. What if I'm Apple, because Apple just released the Apple Watch for instance, and 
okay, let's take it to the iPhone, a new product. How do I then do, do what you suggest? Connecting soon with your possible users because it's a new brand new product. Well, I'm assuming that the smart guys at Apple have spent a lot of time with people, with their customers, generally with people before they've even got into the process of making something. So I think we fall into a cycle where we start designing something or we start thinking about what we need and we start throwing ourselves into the design process without first starting to spend time with people. And I'm sure that they've done that through the process. Was I am understanding your question properly? Kind, kind of. <laughs> because I've, I've, I've read the book on Johnny I. He's heading the design um, department now at Apple. And I'm not too sure if they, if they do come up with a new product that, that is the case. That is based on spending time with users. What, what I'm asking is if so, so a new product is released, it's, and let's, unfortunately I'm using Apple because they're very secretive about what they're about to release. How do they test it? How do then what you say connect with your users as soon as possible okay. come into play? All right, so I, I can't speak for Apple itself. I don't know exactly how they run their operations. But what I do know is they do spend a fortune on research. So whether that research is spending time with customers and spending time with people, whether it's spending time with psychologists who have that in insight or neuroscientists, there's a huge amount of money spent on understanding human behavior. So it's not necessarily just spending time with people, it's also spending that time and money on the research with incredibly smart people who know people and who know human behavior. So I think that that's one thing that they've, they've really gotten right. They've understood human behavior, whether they've spent time with people or researched it, and then they've been able to apply that understanding of human behavior within their design. I hope that, that hits the nail a bit close on the head. It does. Okay, cool. Thanks. I was going to mention something else, though, because what if you take it to Samsung versus Google versus Apple Pay versus Google Pay versus Samsung Pay? And why is Apple so successful? Well, I can't answer that one for you, but you know what? I'm going to go and Google it. <laughs> and but then you've got my email and I'll uh, drop me an email and I'll answer that for you. <laughs> Sorry guys, Google is my friend and so is Wi-Fi, so if I was stuck in a tropical island, those are the two things I would miss the most. I wanted to ask, how do you handle a scenario where your customer isn't your user? So for example, businesses where they mandate an application to do something which they then pass on to their employees in an organization. So often that I find there's a lot of resistance because the employees feel that uh, the application forces them to do something even though the business puts it in place to make their life easier. So how do you design for that uh, and obviously delight the users when you have this initial resistance that what's being given to them is more to monitor them rather than help them in what they're doing. Okay, so this is where my background in marketing plays out. So I started my career in marketing and this is where we spend a lot of time with our readers, with our um, customers to, to understand what issues they had around it. So if they had concerns, worries on how this was going to affect their life, we would literally, as marketers who are supposed to be able to do this kind of thing and sell ice cubes to Eskimos, was we would figure out a way that would make it um, more friendly for them, something that wasn't as much of a threat. So I think in that, that kind of process, you're still spending time with the guys who are going to be in, using the application in the, the end. You're finding out what their frustrations are, so you're finding out what they f don't feel safe about, and then you're figuring out ways to build a bit more trust in that level. So I think it's, there's a lot of participation that happens there. I'm not sure what kind of level you're talking about, how many people would be using that application in the end, but it's still, it's, it's still using, um, spending a lot of time with those people and finding out how you can alleviate that resistance. So there's always a way around that. It's just, it's getting down to what it's going to be. You can only really do that by spending time with those people 
Well, at least I think so. Not everyone thinks so, but I enjoy that, that approach. Uh, all right, in my scenario, very rarely do we interact with all the users because we've got probably 100 customers and each of those have hundreds of users. So how do you identify you know, your user subset or your uh, persona profiles that you're going to be designing for when it's so varied, uh, varied, coming even from education level to people who've never used devices before all the way up to you know, managerial position and iPads and all? Okay, so this is sounding like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> I'm not sure what kind of business you're talking about. Uh, so just to give you background, uh, we design for field force. Okay. So obviously companies like um, retailers, they've got a field force out that goes and collects marketing data or checks products in store. Um, but the variety obviously just covers the board in terms of how capable their employees are. Because you get entry level people with basic education and you get people in managerial positions who know how to use the hardware. Okay, so my question there is, is why? <laughs> why are you not spending time with those people? Why don't you have access to them? There's just too many people. Okay, so but then you break that down into sample size. So you would obviously not speak to everyone, you speak to a small amount of them. Um, and generally, thank goodness, UX is not necessary like, like marketing, so you don't need as big a sample size. But what I do try and do is get a range of different people with different kind of personas. So you, you still need to have some idea in your mind about the different kinds of people you want to study first to make sure that they're taking those kind of different profiles so you get a broader range of results. Um, that's the way I would go about it. So, and then start recruiting based on that. And I mean, it depends on your application and your business process and how many different cultures you have involved as well in different countries possibly, but try and get about 10 people so from, from the different scenarios. Okay, thank you. Cool, thank you.